Hello everyone, welcome to one more video um, of my videos, I will not say more. Most of you know me, those of you that you don't know me, hi, my name is Sofia Tsurlaki. I am an academic of Islamic studies, Muslim myself, and um, I create uh, videos that aim to educate the masses. Given that the majority of Muslims nowadays and non-Muslims that are interested in Islam, they don't really read that much. Um, not all of them, some do read, but majority. So, in today's video, in today's episode, I will talk about Al-Ghazali. And more specifically, because Al-Ghazali um, wrote many books, but more specifically, I will talk about the misogyny of Al-Ghazali, how Al-Ghazali hated women and taught Muslims to hate women. Now, before I go into... And, okay, for those of you that you will get uh, easily offended, um, I will... Today's video will be unique in the sense that I will use only Al-Ghazali's own words from his own books. To prove my point. The points that I will prove are, one, Al-Ghazali was not using the Quran as a source when he was talking about women. Al-Ghazali was not even using a hadith when he was talking or bad-mouthing women. Al-Ghazali was using Persianate philosophy, ancient Greek philosophy, um, popular traditions of uh, Persia, and uh, popular traditions of uh, Christianity. They say that Al-Ghazali was the reformist. Um, I mean, he reformed Islam. I would say Al-Ghazali deformed Islam, at least when it comes to women. In other matters, I will not touch. He did his best. That being said, my criticism is not on Al-Ghazali himself. The reason being that Al-Ghazali was a troubled individual. He had mental health issues. He was what today we would call a, a, a vulnerable individual, okay? And this has been touched upon, has been discussed, even his biographer, the ancient biographer that uh, wrote about him. Let me tell you his name, the name of the biographer. Uh, I think page 17, yes. So if you have um, Abu, Abu Hassan Abd al Gharif, son of Ismail, the Khatib al Farisi. He wrote the biography of Al-Ghazali. This you can find it in uh, Deliver Us From Error, which is one of the most um, widely... Ac um, not acceptable, but it exists. It's very easy to, catch, to, to, to get this book. Contrary to the books that I will read to you today, that you, I mean, I couldn't find them in hard copy. I had to download them online. So, in this book, uh, Deliverance from Error, page 14, you can find the name of the, um, of the biographer. And then we will see later on, or maybe should I see it now? Hmm? Yeah, how Al-Ghazali was, was not okay, mentally was not okay. And even Al-Ghazali himself has said it, he had episodes, he, has, he had problems, okay? Be more specific about that. Um... Oh, I didn't. Oh, he, according to the symptoms that we know from the biographer and from Ghazali's work himself, he um, most probably had a clinical hysteria. So my criticism, of course, I'm harsh on Ghazali because he he did things that was not acceptable to to do. But my problem, my beef, as we say in today's world, is not with Ghazali himself. My beef is with those scholars, hundreds and thousands of scholars, that until today, late 20th century, promoted Al-Ghazali and made Al-Ghazali, you know, a prominent figure in, in Islam on the expense of women. And now the reason, I mean, the, how I reached to that level to start uh, checking Ghazali's misogyny is that I am, I'm collecting material for a book that, inshallah, inshallah, if God gives me time and strength, I will write after I finish my PhD about 
the question of women in Islam. Where are the women? Why women disappeared? Why in the in the in the era of the Prophet peace be upon him, we had women being very active in society in Muslim communities, and then the first century also women were active and they were scholars and everything, and then slowly slowly women disappeared until the 19th century. So in this, you know, 1,200 years, where did women go? This is my question. And that's why I go and I dig. And it takes time. But anyway, for today, let's go back to the objective, which is Ghazal. So before you start, those of you that you will be oh, so passionate about Ghazal and you will feel offended, it's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you will stay with your offense, stay with your grief, because offense is sadness in reality, and, and see what that grief tells you. Now let's go to Azali. Uh, a few biographical elements. Um, not to confuse yourselves, although you shouldn't, but anyway. So yeah, he um, lived in the 11th, 10th, 10th century, 10th century um, common era. I will talk about common era um, periods. Uh, technically, it was three, 300 years after the era of the Prophet. Okay? Um, I will not give you biography. You can find biographies. The, the, my point is not his biography. He, he has two parts in his life. Okay? He has his first part, of his, the, the first, the first part of his life, where he did write and he was a prominent scholar of his area. He's Persian. He was Persian. Okay? He was not an Arab. Um, and then he was appointed in... Uh, 1095, when he was 35, 30, 37 years old, he was appointed as the teacher of, um, as a professor in an institution, a university in Baghdad. Now, thing that we need to bear in mind is that this institution in Baghdad, this university aimed to create counter propaganda against the Fatimids. The Fatimids, as we know, or we should know, were Shias. So essentially, Al Ghazali was hired by the vizier to be in a position where he will create Sunni propaganda. And, and I, I, why do I mention that? Does that have anything to do with uh, with women? He does, and we will see it later. But the element of politics is very important. Anyway, he stayed in this position for three or five, four years, and then he had a crisis, huge crisis. He abandoned his family and he uh, let go of his wealth and he started becoming, uh, um, traveling uh, the world for 10 years, I think, um, like, like a monk, let's say, okay? And then he returned. Now, in these years of, of isolation, something clicked, something snapped in his mind. And when he came back, he started writing awful things about women because in his first in the in the works of his first period he doesn't really talk about women okay he talks in general about muslims he doesn't specifically mention women but in his latter period oh my dear god and we will see now the, um, the examples so let's start with that um okay the first source, and I will give you the sources because I want you to go and find them online. They are only available online. Don't ask me why. I don't know. So the first, the first uh, source I use is disciplining the soul and breaking the two desires. The copy I have is from the Islamic Text Society, and it was published in 1995. So I will go first to page 166 where Ghazali, I'm reading you now from his book, okay, Ghazali says, It is told hmm, that Moses was once sitting in company when sa Satan came upon him wearing a cloak in which he assumed many colors. And then he describes the colors and he describes the discussion and continues and says that um, Satan said, said to Moses, Now I would warn you against three things. These are the words of Satan to Moses, according to Al-Ghazali. Never, the first thing, 
Never be alone with a woman who is not lawful to you, for never does a man do so without having me, Satan. Not my companions as his companion, so that I tempt them both with one another. Now, this is number 10. This is a, um, the note of the person who made the translation of this work says, There are a number of misogynous ap apophthegmata of this type, which may be of Christian origin. I want you to keep that. So here he doesn't say he, it's not a hadith, it's not Quran, it's, it's, it's a Christian tradition, a Christian popular tradition. And he started as, it is told that Moses. He doesn't tell us, Ghazali doesn't give us the source, doesn't give us told by whom, when, where. Hmm? Now, does that remind you anything? Does that remind you any uh, uh, Sharia? That's Sharia, because Sharia is the law of God. Any, any, any Islamic law ruling that the two should not stay al alone? Hmm? Does it? Okay, keep that in mind. Now we go to page 167. Of the same source. So we're, we're talking about the same source. Whenever I change a source, I will let you know. And we start with someone once said. Mm. So 167, the page. Someone once said, these are the words of Al-Ghazali. The devil says to, we, to woman, one woman, any woman. The devil says to woman, you are half my army. You are my arrow which, with which I do not miss. You are my confidant. You are my messenger with whom I achieve my wants. Thus far, th thus, half his army. And so this, this is uh, until my wants, it's the words of Satan. Thus, continues Al-Ghazali, it's Al-Ghazali's words. Half his army, Satan's, is desire. The other half being anger. So, here again, because those that they defend Al-Ghazali is oh, so pious and so religious. He always uses the Quran and the Hadith. Ah, uh, really? Because here, someone said, someone whom? Your uncle? Bring me the evidence, Al-Ghazali. Who is someone? So, women, so far, we see that they are strongly related to Satan, okay? First part, Satan is like, you know what, don't stay with a woman because I'm going to use her against you. And here, oh, woman, you are my army. You are, uh, you are working for me. Now, I want you to stop and think. How does that agree with Al-Quran? How does that agree with whatever God, Allah, has told Muslims in the Quran. Does it agree? Because, hmm? Think about that. Let's go to the next one. Same book, page 171. Okay. Know that on the outset. Ah, yeah. This is the, <laughs> this is the beginning of the chapter. An exposition of the asp aspirant's obligations regarding the renunciation of undertaking of marriage. Okay. So, Ghazali himself says, Know that at the outset the aspirant should not occupy his heart and his soul with marriage, for this would distract him very seriously from tre treading the path and would cause him to find solace in his wife. God forbid, huh? Did Allah tell us in, 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 in the Quran that uh, the wife and the husband are garments of each other and, um, you know, solace of each other? But here, Ghazali says, do not, because God forbid you will find solace in your wife. Huh. Again, is this? And these are his words, okay? He doesn't claim to be hadith. He doesn't take from Al-Quran. It's his own words. So these are from this source. Let's go to another source. The next source is... Let me open it in front of me. The Etiquette of Marriage, translated by, by, by Madeleine Farah and published in 1976. And let's go to page 120. I have it on PDF in front of me and I'm trying to find it. I will put on my glasses because I struggle a bit. So, I read from the book. 
the authoritative statement in this context, uh, that, that, uh, this is the beginning of the chapter, of the second part of the chapter, titled Examination of the Husband's Rights. And he says, Ghazali says, the authoritative statement in this context is that marriage constitutes a form of enslavement. Thus, she, the wife, is his slave and she should obey the husband absolutely in everything he demands. Ah. <laughs> yeah, okay. So according to Al-Ghazali, and this is his personal opinion, no hadith, no Quran, as always, the authoritative statement, by whom, by whose authority, who stated it, when did he state it, or she, I think it was he, that marriage constitutes a form of enslavement for the woman, apparently, thus she is his slave. Keep that in mind. Now we go to another nice book. So we saw, until now, we have seen um, Christian influences. And, you know, um, his own understanding, his own... We haven't seen any hadith and we haven't seen anything about Quran. Now, that being said, in those two books that I told you, there are a, a, a plethora of a hadith that all of them are against women because I'm, I'm giving you the highlights. If, if you read the books and you are a woman, most probably you will feel sick. And there is a plethora of, of a hadith that he employs, but those hadith that he employs are weak hadith. And if you don't understand what I mean by a hadith, uh, weak hadith, go to my hadith criticism videos. And he actually, uh, Ghazali, uses all the, uh, the hadith that I mentioned back then in the, in the videos. So we see that even when he employs a hadith, these are weak hadith. But this is not my objective today. Today I want to show, you know, strong misogyny that is just his imagination, his personal uh, feelings. I don't know what happened to him when he traveled far away, whether he was he fell in love with a woman and the woman rejected him, but he came back and a different person and he came back vicious against women. Anyway, let's go to the last book for today. I'm trying to keep the videos short. Um, the title, sorry, the title is Council for Kings. Nasihat al-Muluk, uh, translated by Bagley or Bagley, uh, printed by Oxford University Press in 1964. Now, the first thing that um, surprised me in this book is this. So, if you go to the content, if you go to the content um, page, I have it on my mobile. Okay. So if you go into the content, now this is the book for the kings, okay? This is the, the book where Al-Ghazali theoretically uh, offered his advice to rulers on how to be good rulers. So part one is all about the principles of the creed, the faith, etc. Okay, good, yeah. Then we go to part two. And the chapters are as follow. On qualities required in kings. Okay. The account of the kings of Persia. Okay. On the wazirate and the character of wazirs, wazirs. Okay, yeah, politics. On the art of the pen and the functions of the secretaries. All good. Anyway, he has chapters after chapters all about politics. And then chapter number seven, on women and their good and bad points. Between me and you, there are no good points. But anyway. And I'm like... So it's like, imagine, if, <laughs> it's like if you send uh, or you, you go yourself to study politics and you have, you know, about governance and, and all these modules, you know, international relations, and then it's like women and the evil they bear. But anyway, let's go and see what he put on this chapter. Forgive me. Page 149. Am I in the correct? Yes. And 49. Mm, okay. The Prophet, God bless him, stated. Now, these are the words of Al Ghazali. I'm reading you from Al Ghazali. The Prophet, God bless him, stated. The intelligent man has four marks by which he can be recognized. He overlooks the offenses of persons who have wronged him. He treats lesser men humbly. 
he outstrips higher placed men in good works. He always resembles God, etc., etc., etc. Now, this part, I want you to understand that he doesn't give us, Al-Ghazali doesn't give us uh, uh, the Isnat. The if this is, uh, because Al-Ghazali was born 300 something years after the, the death of the Prophet. So Al-Ghazali himself could not have heard the Prophet saying that. Who said that? Where is this now? Where is, because if this is a hadith, you, Ghazali, as a scholar, need to give us this now. Then you need to give us at least the name of the person that, you know, narrated the hadith. No name. The Prophet said. Just b b b Ghazali slept in the night and he woke up in the next morning and said something. And here you will ask me, but did he say anything bad? That's not the objective here. The point is not whether what is, is stated is bad or good. The point is that Al-Ghazali puts on the Prophet's mouth words that the Prophet most probably never uttered. Anyway, we continue. Ah, uh, yeah, no, 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 this is the, there is more about this. So, ha! Yes, the note on the book about this is the note that the, the, the translator and, and, you know, put on this book is that um, this saying is attributed not to the prophet but to Hakim al-Furs, a sage of the ancient Persians. So this was a popular tradition. This was something that was said. It was a quote okay, that was going around. And it was, I, we have other sources that they quote the same quote, and all the other sources, they told us that this is from a sage of ancient Persians, the name of which was Hakim al-Furs. Al-Ghazali takes this, and he manipulates it, and he presents it, the Prophet, God bless him, said. Of course, Al-Ghazali thought that in his vicinity, in his area, in the university he taught, people will not know about that. Because he taught in Baghdad. Okay? But, and that's why we need to read. That's why we need to know. Because if you know, if you have knowledge, you have memory. And if you have memory, you can cross-examine. Because if you, if you, if you don't know about this Persian, uh, Persian uh, sage, or if, if this note was not here, we wouldn't have any proof. And we didn't know. We, we didn't live at this era, but evidence exists. And this will be very useful on the next, um, on, on the final mention of, of this chapter. So, the next point of this book. So, un, uh, right now we also saw that uh, Ghazali intentionally misattributed to the Prophet things that were popular tradition. And here someone will say, oh, maybe Ghazali didn't know really. The learned polymath, the well-traveled scholar, did know. Mm. Then maybe we should take with a pinch of salt everything he has said and not make it the core teachings of, of how Islam is being practiced until today. But anyway, let's not let my emotions overtake me because women, we are women and emotional, aren't we? Let me see in the comments how many men will be emotional. So... Next page, 163. I want you to download those books and read it by your own eyes. So, page 163, we go with a teacher. Hmm. So, yeah, Al-Ghazali was very strongly against women being educated. And this is a very important element in understanding why we don't have any female scholars. Why? Because from the 3rd century Hijri, women were not permitted to study. Because if they were studying, then men wouldn't be able to say that women have half the intelligence of men. But anyway, God bless their souls of men. So, Ghazali, what he wrote here. A teacher was teaching girls how to write. A sage passed by and said, this teacher is teaching wickedness to the wicked. First of all, if they are wicked, they don't need to be taught wickedness. They have it naturally. Secondly, a teacher, any teacher, we don't know which teacher, and then a sage passed by and said what he said. Which sage? And what, what that has to do with Islam? What that has to do with Al-Quran? What that has to do with the Prophet, peace be upon him? Does that anything have to do with Islam? Or you just bring your past and your, the, the, the luggage of your Persian ancestors and you just 
شوفيد ان اسلام الغزالي وي كونتينيو ذا سيم بيج ا سيج بيرهابس ذا سيم سيج وي دونت نو هاو ماني سيجز هي نيو ا سيج ويشت ذات هيز شورت وايف مايت هاف بين تول people asked him why did you not marry a wife of full stature stature you know high a tall woman and the sage stated a woman is an evil thing and the less there is of an evil thing the better so automatically women are evil and this was also this this statement a woman is an evil thing and blah 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 was um So, kula ma qasura. The shorter an evil I think is is an Arabic joke. It was a joke. It was a something to say for for people to say. Like like today we say that the the expensive perfumes go in small bottles. Okay, this is something for fun. These were the jokes of the time. So this was an Arab joke. But he didn't present it as a joke. He presented it as wisdom of a sage, and he put it in his book. So until now, you understand the spirit, okay? If uh, women are evil, the shaitan has claimed that uh, he's, uh, you know, women are working for him, so women have uh, uh, um, association with shaitan. Ghazali has also said that uh, 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 the male sexual desire is absolutely normal, but the female sexual desire is the evidence that women are related to shaitan and also he has advised men that they don't um, listen to their wives and they don't consider their opinions or statements because if they do so they will die young okay um, the last bit because we cannot go through everything honestly diamonds 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 not not of a good quality so page 164 when eve oh yeah So here, what Al-Ghazali does, I'll read it for you, I'll read it for you and you think of yourselves. When Eve disobeyed Almighty God and ate fruit which he had forbidden to her from the tree of paradise, the Lord, be he praised, punished women with 18 things. Oh, dear God. Now, let me tell you, I'm coming from a Christian tradition. Okay, I was Christian when I was young. Um, in Christianity, we say that the one punishment that Eve received for the, you know, eating the apple was the, the pains of birth. You know, the pains of having a child. Now, Azali, he found 18. He doesn't tell us exactly where did he find them, but he did. And he starts. The, the things, the 18 things, menstruation, childbirth, separation from mother and father and marriage to stranger, pregnancy through the stranger, not having control over her own person. Really? God God said that? Because I don't remember it in the Quran. Um, having a lesser share in inheritance. Is this why the Quran mentions that the woman has a share? Because Allah in the Quran mentioned that this is because the man is being given more. Allah didn't say, and women will take half because of Eve. But Al-Ghazali makes his own ideas. Um, uh, her liability to be divorced and inability to divorce, which is... I will not say the word. I'm a good girl. I will not swear. Mm. It's being lawful for men to have four wives, but for a woman to have only one husband. So this is a punishment, apparently, for a woman. Uh, because we said that the woman desire, evil desire, we shouldn't. Uh, normally, I mean, Allah, forgive me for my thoughts. If women are so evil and so bad, and men are not to be married, because, uh, oh, God forbid, they will, you know, go close to their wives. So if women were so evil then this should be a punishment for men. I mean, having four? <laughs> Isn't it? God forgive me. Anyway, the fact that she must stay secluded in the house, with, ah, where, where did Allah say that? Where did the Quran mention that? How? Even the Prophet himself, he insisted, let the women go out. Let women go to the mosque. Women were approaching the Prophet in public to ask him things. One woman approached the Prophet in public to, 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 to propose himself. He didn't accept, but that's another point. So, and, uh, women were not secluded. God didn't punish women 
to be secluded because of Eve. But Ghazali. Anyway, there is there are 18 things that um one of these is like the fact that merit has 1000 components, only one of which is attributed to women, with while 999 are attributed to men. Are, are, are you talking about the names of God or what? What, what do you mean here? Azali, not you. If you're watching, Azali. Um, yeah, he says here, he says the fact that if women are profligate, they will be given only half as much torment as the rest of Muslim community in the resurrection day. So, how is this a punishment? This is benefit, right? But he puts it as one of the 18 things that God punishes women with. To begin with, nowhere in the Quran, uh, God says that, oh, women will take half the, um, half the punishment. Nowhere. Quran is absolutely clear and straight that everyone will be judged according to his or her actions. Nothing, no gender goes there. And here you will ask me, oh, you're not happy? No, I'm not happy because he distorts the Quran. He distorts my religion. Anyway... I will not continue with the 18 things that he thought and also the, the 18 things that contradict each other. I mean, this is not a punishment. Why do you put it as a punishment? Um, I will not continue. I will go to the last one because the, the video will become too long. <laughs> Listen to this. So we are in Council for Kings, page 165. The race of women consists of ten species, and the character of each of these corresp corresponds and is related to the distinctive quality of one of the animals. One species of women resembles the pig, another the ape, another the dog, another the snake, another the mule, another the scorpion, another the mouse, another the pigeon, another the fox, and another the sheep. Now, I will not go into details. Please download the book and read it. But from all these species, only one, the sheep, is good. Can you imagine why the sheep, the, the woman that resembles the sheep, is good? Well, I'm sorry, Ghazali, I don't want to be a sheep. And now, I mean, question number one, where did you find this? Because is it in the Quran? No. Is it in any hadith? Weak, strong, uh, you know? No. And here is where you need to be responsible and you need to learn people. And here I want to thank uh, one of... Okay, I know. I knew already. But I want to thank um, Zeta. Zeta is a Greek woman. She is in my Facebook. We, you know, we, are, we are connected through social media. And when I, when I posted this thing, because I have, I have a post about that on my Facebook um, account. So when I posted that, Zeta, which is Greek, and she's learned, and that's why it's important to learn things. When she read that uh, part, she snapped, and she was like, she sent me a message, and it was like, misogynist literature was actually quite widespread in the ancient Mediterranean world, with examples ranging from ancient Greece to Egypt, especially in its latter historical periods. Looking at the passage of women compared to animals, I thought of the Greek lyrical poet Simonides of Caea, and he, this poem here in Greek. So he sent, she sent me the, the, the poem, and I'm, I'm, I'm thankful because I knew that. So Simonides of Caea, today's Gia, we call it Gia in Greece, um, lived in... Uh, where did Simonides live? Okay, Simonides lived uh, between 556 and 469 before Common Era. So he lived approximately 1,500 years before uh, Al-Ghazali. And he has a poem that uh, is called Iambos. I'm, I'm telling you the Greek language. Um, Iambos means poem. It, it was a type of poem. So it was uh, Iambos kata gynekon. Translation means a poem against women. And I will translate as much as I can from this poem. Um, he describes... Ten women in total that they have come from the pig, the fox, the dog. Does it remind you anything? The earth, the sea, the donkey, the... Ah, Nefitsa. Ah, that, that, I don't know this in English. This is a, a, a small animal that goes and eats uh, chicken and their eggs. Um, 
uh, the female uh, horse, the monkey, and the bee. Now, according to Simonides, the best among them is the bee. Now, for you to know, Simonides' poem was supposed to be sculpted, was supposed to be uh, to amuse people, okay? And he was describing ten women. Does that connect with Ghazali? I will not continue reading parts and, and making relations. Because, as I said earlier, my objective is not Al-Ghazali himself. God bless his soul, he lived in his own means. He was a vulnerable individual, and I'm very sensitive when it comes to people with mental health conditions. He did his best. Was it good or bad? I'm not to judge. At the end of the day, Al-Ghazali was a colleague of mine. We are doing the same thing. We study, we create knowledge, that's what we do. My problem is with the fact that all this misogyny, all these rules that he has, because I, I only gave you bits and bytes, he has horrible rules that women should not go out of the house, women should not be educated because they're evil. In every time women are evil that way. Uh, it's not even that women should not go out of the house because men are weak and they cannot control their sexual desires. No, it's that, oh, women are evil. Look, the men. The problem is that Al-Ghazali is a superstar in Islam. The problem is that Al-Ghazali's ideas have been applied into Muslim societies. Not Muslim societies, in communities of Muslims. Let's, let's be accurate of what we say. Millions of Muslim women throughout the last 1,000 years have suffered have been prevented from knowledge, have been beaten. Oh yeah, Ghazali. Ghazali is very positive into beating women. It's like a woman, uh, evil, beat, beat this out of her. So physical violence, mental and spiritual abuse. Uh, 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 because when you have a smile, uh, Alhamdulillah, I'm a woman that my brain works a lot and I love knowledge. If you stop, I mean, the worst thing that someone can do to me is just lock me somewhere without books, without knowledge. I can't. I can't breathe if I don't study. Studying it makes me happy. Teaching makes me happier. This is torture. If you, if you, if you tell me that, oh, you, you're, you're not going to learn, you're not going to read anything, that, that is torture. That will impact me massively. So millions of women have suffered throughout the centuries because of Al-Ghazali's teaching, because the male ulama, made him, oh, you know, an authority and just kept his ideas and made his ideas essential part of, of how Islam is being practiced today. And of course, there is no, it's not a, you know, doesn't require much thought to realize why. <laughs> because according to Al-Ghazali, men are perfect, women are imperfect, and whatever wrong uh, men do, it's because of women. And because women are not, you know, for Al-Ghazali, women have supernatural uh, characteristics because of their association with Satan. So, you know, Satan is using them to, to harm the men. Yeah, if I was a man, if I was in a patriarchal society, yeah, I would have promoted that, promote that because, come on, I'm the good guy always. I win win. Whatever happens. If I'm a pious man, I'm a pious man. If I am a horrible... Man, I will not say more. Uh, uh, it's not me. It's the women. How can I resist the women? Ghazali said it. It's the Satan that works through the women. So, uh, me, me, good man, poor, me, me, innocent. Anyway, so. Leave Al-Ghazali. He did his best in his limited mental capacity. And leave the scholars of the past. In today's world, we need to learn of ourselves. When I, when I, uh, uh, for ourselves, when I published this on my Facebook, the first comment of a man, always a man, was like, ah, let me tell you that about this, um, uh, that we read in page 120, that um, yeah, marriage is slavery and she is to be his slave. This is a mistake of the translation. Really, Habibi, is it? And even if I accept that it's a mistake of the translation, it isn't. But even if I accept it, hmm, 
What about the rest? What about the rest? That women are evil. Shaitan is for women. Women are for shaitan. Huh? What about the fact that Al-Ghazali never used Al-Quran? Never used Al-Hadith? Essentially what Al-Ghazali did, he took ancient Greek philosophy and poetry. This was not even philosophy, it was poetry. He put the Greek, uh, ancient Greek uh, trash and then he put the uh, Persian trash and then he put his own imagination and he willingly distorted uh, popular uh, quotes of his era and he mixed them and he made a very nice omelette and he said that, that's Islam. All these quotes that I quoted today have no relation to the Quran, no relation to Islam. But this is how Islam is being practiced in many Muslim majority countries, in many communities of Muslims. So, before you worship someone like Al-Ghazali, in the sense that, oh, amazing scholar, a oh, wise man of Islam, bother yourself. To download the books. You don't even have to pay them. The idea that, oh, I cannot pay or I cannot have them delivered in my house. I, you know, there is no available bookstore online. The way you watch me now, the way you watch videos. You know what videos? With cats. You can download these books. Download the books. And instead of watching soap operas and instead of uh, worrying about football, sit and read yourself. Knowledge is there. Ignorance is a choice. Mm? And for those of you that you feel very offended that I said something bad about Ghazali, which is one of the forefathers, I want you to be offended. I want you to be, I want you to be sad. I would love you to be sad and angry because for every ounce of anger and sadness that you have, I want you to think how many women have been physically assaulted, beaten. Some of them died in the process. Hmm? Remember a week ago in India that a man beat his sister to death because the girl just menstruated and he thought that she had sex. And the girl never been taught about her body. She didn't know what the blood is. She couldn't give him an explanation. And he was beating her for three days and he killed her. So... Many of my sisters, billions of my sisters, have been physically abused, mentally abused, spiritually abused in all the centuries because of Al-Ghazali, because of your idol. So do you feel sad? Good, because I feel sad for my sisters. So we are even. That is all for today. Emotionally strong uh, video. Learn, people. Learn. Read by yourselves. Do not rely into Dawa brothers and uh, Salafi sisters telling you who is what and who is good and who is bad and, you know, what is your role and what. You will, you will be shocked to understand how much of the Islamic practices are not Islamic practices and how, much of these, how, how many of these practices are actually the exact reason that Allah decided to reveal the Quran because Allah wanted us to go away from the problems of or from the distortions that the Christians and the Jews had you know before Islam and instead of us following Al-Quran and, 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 and doing what God told us to do here we have Al-Ghazali putting Christian uh, traditions, ancient Greek traditions, Persian traditions, and, has, <laughs> and that's how you will practice your Islam. <laughs> and all the ulama for the last thousand years telling us, oh, Ghazali, amazing. Ghaz um, amazing. And that being told, I don't, I don't want to reduce the value of all of Al-Ghazali's work. But when it comes to me, when it comes to my gender, when it comes to my sisters, I will not accept it. Perhaps Al-Ghazali was fantastic when he was talking, uh, theorizing about Sufism. Perhaps Al-Ghazali was good when he was talking about philosophy in general. I don't care. When my sisters are being beaten, when my sisters are being stopped from education, when my sisters are to be told that they are slaves and they need to obey, I don't care about Sufism. I don't. That's all. Thank you for watching. Permit me my passion. I'm a Greek person. I'm passionate. And I will see you again in one of 
the next videos, most probably it will be the videos about the marital contracts, which will be very important for you, my ladies. That's all for today. See you in one of the next videos.